Okay, I, I won't do another round of thank you, but uh, yeah, so today I'll be talking about uh, how to obtain uh, gravitational indices, and uh, I'll talk about a new form of uh, an old mechanism called the attractor mechanism that uh, people were interested in for extremo black holes for a very long time. And I'll reference work with uh, Joaquin and Samir, who are in the audience, uh, Murat, and uh, also work with uh, uh, some work in progress with an excellent grad student, uh, Jan Borok. Um, great, so um, an important lesson from the past couple of years is that classical extremal solutions should not be trusted. So I'll take the first five minutes to uh, justify this claim. And, but this, uh, the idea is that this will motivate us to re-explore uh, all the extremal solutions that we've found throughout the years. Um, so why should we not trust extremal black hole solutions? A general feature of extremal black holes is that they have a near horizon region that's ADS two times S2. And uh, in this region, I can compute quantum corrections by doing a one loop expansion around this background. So I can take the metric and deform it by some arbitrary perturbation H mu nu. There's an infinite number of modes that have um, a non-zero eigenvalue when I do a quadratic expansion of the action. But there's also an infinite number of modes whose eigenvalue is exactly zero. These are zero modes. Um, and uh, the meaning of these zero modes is that they're largely theomorphisms of the near horizon region. They don't change the local curvature of the space-time, but they change the way in which these extremal black holes are glued to the asymptotic space-time. Um, and uh, these uh, modes have been observed in the past by numerous papers of uh, Sen and collaborators, but I just want to briefly describe the treatment of these modes. So suppose that I, my goal is to compute the quantum corrections around this background. Uh, there's a factor, suppose that S0 is the entropy of the black hole that's given by the scale of this ADS2 space-time. Uh, this factor of S0 comes from integrating over all the modes that are massive. And it's pretty much unambiguously computed. You can compute it, let's say, using a heat kernel in ADS2 times S2. Uh, however, in addition to that, you have to integrate over all these largely theomorphisms. And um, you could be smart about it, these, as these authors were, and absorb the S0 dependence in the measure of this path integral that doesn't have any action into the overall uh, power of S0. And uh, seemingly, this gives you the logarithmic correction to the extremal black hole entropy that people have determined in the past. However, now you're still left with uh, something that might be an order one factor uh, that's just an integral over all these largely theomorphisms quotiented out by the space of isometries, where now we've um, scaled uh, the size of ADS2 to be completely independent of, of S0. So, uh, but, but in order to determine the one-loop correction, we should be able to say what this integral is. Is it zero? Is it infinity? Is it a finite number? And this might drastically affect the final result. Uh, and in order to be able to make sense of that integral, that integral technically is divergent. It's a path integral over an infinite number of modes with no action. Uh, what we can do is compare the partition function of extremal black holes to partition functions of black hole that we also know which are near extremal ones, where we turn on a finite temperature. That finite temperature can be viewed as a very tiny deformation of the metric from being extremal to being near extremal. And I can do the expansion once again um, by deforming this now classical metric by the same modes H mu nu. And now I can see what weights all these modes have. So previously, there were an infinite number of modes that had exactly zero weight. Uh, now they're all lifted the, by the presence of this uh, term in the background. And all the modes have a weight that's proportional to the temperature itself. So this means that uh, what turning on a temperature means that all these modes are actually that, that were previously zero modes at zero temperature now actually become strongly coupled and uh, they have a very large effect. And in fact, you can actually track if you plug in the most arbitrary h mu nu into uh, this form of the metric, what pops out 
is precisely the Schwarzian derivative uh, that appears at quadratic order, but also persists at higher and higher orders in the expansion. And at small temperatures, um, this uh, theory is a strongly coupled theory. So namely, uh, this theory appears with uh, this coupling, Q cubed times L Planck, where Q is the charge of the black hole. And uh, one can redefine time in this theory such that uh, you can see that the actual effective coupling of this theory is Q cubed L Planck times T. So when that number is small, you cannot evaluate, you cannot uh, do a trustworthy evaluation by this path integral, of this path integral using a saddle point approximation. It's a strongly coupled quantum mechanics and you have to solve it exactly. Uh, luckily, uh, Stanford and Witten solved it exactly and found that it's one loop exact, uh, which drastically simplifies the problem. And the one loop correction is proportional to T to the three halves. Uh, so the important thing that we see is that in addition to this old piece uh, in which we can see the logarithmic corrections and the entropy that depend on the area, we have a new one loop correction that depends on the temperature. And in the limit when the temperature goes to zero, this partition function receives a very, very large quantum correction from this term. And for instance, you could look at the density of states by Laplace transforming the previous partition function. Um, and you find that compared to the semi-classical answer that even includes the previous one loop expansion calculation that I plotted in the dotted red, um, the uh, actual density of states when you include the full quantum corrections deviates a lot from the semi-classical density of states when uh, the energies above extremality uh, hits uh, the scale that appears as the Schwarzian coupling. Uh, so, in conclusion, as we approach extremality, the quantum effects become large and the classical solution doesn't predict the right partition function. And you might think, uh, so in this discussion, I, uh, for now I was talking about uh, non-supersymmetric black holes. You, you might think that this is a feature that uh, disappears in the presence of supersymmetry. However, that's not the case. Um, if you do exactly the same exercise for supersymmetric black holes, you see that the deviation is even larger. Namely, uh, at uh, very low uh, energies above extremality, uh, you find that there are no states at all. And, uh, but luckily, uh, one finds that um, the uh, effect of this Schwarzian is to give an exact delta function in the density of states that corresponds to the BPS states that people have counted in the past in string theory. Um, and a final point is that there's another way, a more geometric way, uh, to see that these extremal solutions should not be trusted. And uh, this was discussed in this paper from this summer. Uh, and th th this is um, obtained by constructing um, a wormhole, a spatial wormhole, uh, by looking at the thermal field double state at infinite Euclidean time. So if you look at a thermal field double state at infinite Euclidean time in a sector of fixed charge, you're essentially projecting down to the uh, linear combination of ground states. So the state that you get is this linear combination of BPS states, maximally entangled combination of BPS states between left and right. And in this state, You'd expect that if the classical geometry was trustworthy, the classical geometry has an infinitely long throat. That's one of the main features that all of you probably know about extremal black holes. However, what these authors uh, computed uh, is they managed to compute the actual uh, expectation value of the length in this uh, uh, TFD state. And instead of finding that the answer is infinity, they find that the answer scales with the logarithm of the charge of the black hole. So, uh, you know, these are very drastically different answers, meaning uh, that uh, if I give you an extremal geometry and I told you the length between point A and point B, you should not really trust that that length is computed correctly, especially if uh, the geodesic between point A and point B probes the near horizon region. Um, so uh, here I've only discussed uh, uh, single center black holes in uh, um, Einstein-Maxwell theory, 
and a supergravity, the results were quite general, but there is a whole zoo of extremal solutions that people obtained in the past. So what do we do with them? So for instance, uh, one can consider multi-center solutions that people discuss, have discussed in the context of ADS2 fragmentation. These are the so-called Majumdar Papa Petru solutions. Uh, there's also more complicated solutions in supergravity that include scalar moduli. These are so-called attractor solutions. And there's generalizations of these that are also multicenter that also have scalar moduli that have very interesting physics. These are called then f solutions. Uh, the point is that you take uh, a space-time with exactly the same asymptotics, but now you can split the charges amongst uh, different black holes and because these black holes are extremal, usually they have the mass equal to the charge, and the gravitational and electric forces cancel, meaning that they're in perfect equilibrium. But that also says, and also uh, there is an infinite throat for associated to each one of these charges. Uh, but that also says that uh, following the same strategy that we followed in the past, is difficult, especially if you want to analyze these multicenter solutions, because there are very rarely any static solutions at non-zero temperature. Once I turn on a temperature, the black holes attract and, uh, and all hell breaks loose. I can't actually write down the solution to expand around it. So, however, we will see uh, several exceptions from this in what follows. So the exceptions that I'll be uh, talking about today are not generic. Um, they'll have to do with how we understand the contributions of such solutions, not to the partition function at finite temperature, but to a specific form of a partition function called the supersymmetric index. So as all of you know, a uh, supersymmetric index in a quantum mechanical system, let's say that I fix all the, uh, all the charges except one, uh, that's associated to uh, angular momentum, let's say. So the index at uh, finite beta is, uh, takes this form. And uh, in very simple systems, it can be written as the difference between the degeneracy of bosonic BPS states minus the degeneracy of fermionic BPS states times e to the minus beta e BPS. So this is something very basic that just has to do with the fact that in, when I have supersymmetry, uh, states that are not protected are not counted by this index. So the question is, uh, suppose that I view I uh, have uh, this quantity in the putative dual of a black hole. Uh, what type of black hole solutions do I need to look at in order to compute this index? And uh, as emphasized yesterday uh, by Samir as well, uh, one trick that proved to be very useful and is extremely generic is that I can replace this factor of minus 1 to the f by e to the 2 pi i times angular momentum or times some r charge that's related to the fermion number. And the reason why this is a useful trick is because it tells you that instead of looking at black holes that are static, instead of looking at these extremal solutions, you should be looking at black holes that have uh, an angular velocity. That's because angular velocity is like the chemical potential for angular momentum. So if we turn on an angular velocity, we can get this factor of 2 pi i in front of j. Um, one thing that I should mention, uh, oh, perhaps I'll mention it later. So um, the angular velocity in Euclidean signature, I'll denote by big omega, it's related to i times the angular velocity in Lorentzian signature. And in order to put, uh, to obtain this factor of minus one to the f, we in principle have to sum up over all angular velocities that take this form where n is an integer. However, we'll see that only a finite number of those contribute. So let's try this in the simplest example that we know to see if it works. Oh, uh, yeah, so some overall solutions, as I said. Let's try this in the simplest example um, that we know to see if it works. Suppose that I have an extremal Reister Nordstrom black hole. Now I want to, what uh, this calculation is instructing me is that if I wanted to compute the index, I shouldn't go to zero temperature and compute the extremal entropy. That's not trustworthy. Instead, 
I should just turn on an angular velocity. So as you all know, the kern neumann solution is very ugly. It has uh, you know, a million parameters. It takes a couple of minutes to even write down. Uh, but uh, you know, its Euclidean action has been computed in the past. And uh, just for simplicity here, I'll write it in a large beta expansion. So in a large beta expansion, it takes this form. And one immediately observes that if, I, if in this uh, formula I plug beta omega to be plus or minus 2 pi, these two factors cancel. And in fact, this uh, persists to all orders in perturbation theory and beta. This was just a convenient thing to, uh, to show you how the simplification occurs. So the answer that you get from, these, uh, from setting beta omega to take this form is uh, precisely the form of the index. It's minus beta times EBPS times uh, the entropy. Uh, and I'll, I'll comment a little bit where, uh, where this formula uh, comes from in a second. And importantly, this geometry has killing spinners. So even though we're discussing a black hole at finite temperature, which people usually think uh, they're not supersymmetric, uh, these black holes are actually supersymmetric. It's just that they're uh, Euclidean solutions. Um, option two is to put beta omega to take any of the other values. And you might think I have a problem immediately because uh, uh, the Euclidean action does not take the form of an index. It has some complicated temperature dependence. Uh, however, uh, a fact about these solutions when n is different than 0 and minus 1, these were the ones that I had on the previous slide, is that uh, the geometry does not have killing spinners. So now I actually have to be a bit careful when doing the gravitational, the supergravity path integral. Because um, uh, the boundary conditions associated to the index are actually supersymmetric boundary conditions. So they're actually invariant under large superdiffeomorphisms. So there's a set of fermionic modes in my gravitational path integral that doesn't, uh, don't have any weight in the action, once again. And usually, uh, the set of large superdiffeomorphisms need to be co quotiented out by the space of superisometries. However, if I don't have any killing spinners, there are no superisometries. So what you're left over with is a fermionic integral that doesn't have a bosonic counterpart. And if I just do an integral over fermionic modes, you just get zero. Um, good. So the conclusion is that these modes don't contribute. And I just want to point out that um, for, for the people that, are, that care about uh, very technical aspects in the room, uh, this argument is quite different from um, talking about uh, the fermionic modes of the center of mass. Uh, these diffeomorphisms are different. Um, they appear even when studying just the uh, asymptotically ADS2 times S2 solutions. Okay, so the take home message so far is that there are geometries at finite beta that are supersymmetric. Uh, they have globally defined killing spinners, and those are the ones uh, that contributing to the index. So what about the previously mentioned more general solutions? And first I'll talk about multi-center black holes that don't have any scalar moduli. So for instance, these are relevant in uh, supergravity without uh, any vector supermultiples. So in fact, uh, if I look at space times that are asymptotically flat, all the geometries that have killing spinners have been classified. And one such geometry is called the Israel-Wilson solution. Um, it's a geometry that takes this form. So it has an angular velocity, which is already promising. And these functions u and u tilde, the equations of motion, fixes them to be harmonic functions. So these equations are satisfied everywhere away from the poles of these functions. Um, and if I want my geometry to be asymptotically R3 times S1 or asymptotically uh, Lorentzian, it turns out that the number of poles that I put in this function U and in this function U tilde has to be the same. And I'll denote that by N, the poles in U, I'll denote by Xi, the poles in U tilde, I'll denote by X tilde. Um, and the important thing is that if u is different than u tilde, 
Um, the equations of motion tells us that we have uh, rotational solutions. You see that the equation of motion for omega, for the rotation, is linked uh, to this difference. And it also tells us that even if we start out with a solution that only has uh, electric charges, so uh, that has an electric field, if u and u tilde are different, then that automatically induces a magnetic field as well. And this is something that makes a lot of sense. If you have electric charges, but you also have a rotating solution, then you will induce a magnetic field. Um, however, uh, I still have the points x1, xi, and xi tilde, at which I have to make sure that the metric is smooth. There, I don't actually satisfy the equation that uh, the Laplacian of u and u tilde is equal to zero. So what do I do in order to make sure that the metric is smooth? I want to see that uh, the, uh, uh, the possible singularities at that point are actually coordinate singularities and not actual blow-ups blow in the curvature. Uh, so in order to do that, I take this equation and act with a derivative on it. Uh, so uh, the total result is the Laplacian of u or Laplacian of u tilde. And then I can do an integral over this result. So the Laplacian of u, Laplacian of u tilde only has delta functions at the poles. And then I can integrate uh, this equation along a cylinder that includes exactly one of the sources or one of the anti-sources. And what you get using Stokes' theorem is that the integral over omega along this little circle is precisely this factor. So this might seem problematic at first because we are integrating over an infinitesimal circle. The omega, you could think about it as a gauge field almost uh, for rotations. You are integrating along an infinitesimal circle and getting a non-zero holonomy. Uh, so I need to check that that holonomy can be eliminated through a gauge transformation. In this case, through a coordinate transformation. So uh, the way to do that is uh, we can redefine our time uh, by this gauge parameter lambda, and this changes uh, what omega is uh, by this function. It's precisely like a gauge transformation. And in particular, I can see that I can get rid of this holonomy um, that uh, is on an infinitesimal circle that's contractible uh, through this transformation on time. However, we need to make sure that this coordinate transformation is valid. So there are two cases. The Lorentzian case, in this case, uh, t is not periodic. t is just uh, some uh, continuous time. Uh, however, phi is periodic. And uh, this, uh, the, per the uh, periodicity of phi would tell me that after this coordinate transformation, t should also be periodic if u times a is different than zero. And that's illegal. So the only solution in the Lorentzian case is that u tilde times a is zero, and the same for anti-centers, um, which means that either I have the trivial solution where u and u tilde are just constants, that's just flat space, or I have a solution at which uh, centers and anti-centers coincide. Uh, for those solutions, I can't use this cylinder trick, actually. Uh, so uh, that, that solution just means that u is equal to u tilde. And this is precisely what uh, people call the Majumdar Papa Petru extremal solution that uh, only has an electric field and has no magnetic field. So it has electric charges. However, in Euclidean signature, if my time is periodic, things are a little bit more subtle. Uh, that's because um, since phi is periodic, uh, I can actually uh, make this a consistent coordinate transformation if u tilde times a and u times a tilde are precisely the factors, um, are precisely such that when phi goes to phi plus two pi, uh, t goes to t plus b beta. Uh, and in fact, one can compute the exact angular velocity uh, at each horizon to see how quickly the horizons rotate in such a case. And one finds that the angular velocity at each horizon is also equal to this quantity, the inverse of the angular velocity. So these solutions, in fact, only exist if beta times omega is equal to 2 pi, which is precisely the requirement that I'm computing an index. 
um so let's go through the simplest example in which i have a center and an anti-center ah in this case ah you and u tilde have poles at two different locations and the these are the two smoothness constraints these are the constraints that my manifold doesn't have any actual singularities in the curvature and these tells me tell me that a and a tilde have to both e be equal to q the charge of the black hole and then i can compute the mass of the black hole it's also q and this tells me that the distance between the center and anti center is uh, determined by what beta and q are and uh this plus minus sign ensures that this distance is positive so in fact, one can explicitly write down a coordinate transformation. I won't do it here. Um, but this is actually just the Kernuman solution that I discussed at the beginning of the talk. Um, and uh, as before, I can compute the Euclidean action. This time I can write it as, uh, in order to uh, make things more apparent, I can write this as the area of the black hole minus beta m plus beta omega j. And I get the same result as before. That uh, takes exactly the form of an index. And But to be a bit more explicit, uh, we can compute the area. This one is given by beta, you can compute it explicitly, just, it's just an integral. It's just given by beta times the uh, distance between uh, the uh, center and anti-center. Uh, you can compute what j is, beta omega is just 2 pi. Uh, but notice that both the area and j explicitly depend on the distance between the poles. And the distance itself explicitly depended on beta. So the area of the black hole depends on the temperature. The angular momentum of the black hole depends on the temperature. It's only the overall free energy, the Gibbs free energy, that's come, that takes the form of an index. So we can think about this as an analog of the attractor mechanism. Because in the attractor mechanism, the point is that we have quantities, such as the area of the horizon, that are insensitive to, to the boundary conditions that you impose at infinity. And um, in fact, here, we see that's not the case for the area, but it's the case for the overall Gibbs free energy. And one can do this more generally uh, to uh, understand what um, the Euclidean action is in general. And it's, it's still true that uh, it takes the form of an index. It's also still true uh, that uh, it obeys beta omega is equal to 2 pi. So the conclusion in this case is that if you start out with a Lorentzian extremal solution and you think that, oh, this might be contributing to the index, what you should actually consider is the Euclidean solution with finite temperature, but now where the uh, uh, centers in Majumdar Papa Petru are split into pairs of centers and anti-centers, and this solution is completely smooth and it has um, no uh, infinite proper distances. All the throats are finite. Uh, let me skip this. So what about black holes in theories with vector supermultiplets? So these can have scalar mo moduli. So for instance, uh, we can talk about attractor solutions or multicenter solutions, the multicenter solutions that Benef found in the past. Um, so the metric is actually very similar to the metric of Israel Wilson. The only difference is now is that the action is more complicated because you have to into account, take into account that there are scalars that have a non-trivial profile on the black hole background. And um, one thing that's more complicated is that the relation between uh, this prefactor of space, uh, it's called uh, the entropy function, uh, and harmonic functions is more complicated, but it still can be written. Previously, this was u times u tilde, so it was a product of two harmonic functions. Now it's the square root of a complicated polynomial of harmonic functions. Um, however, uh, we can again study uh, the smoothness of these solutions in precisely the same way as before. Um, the, uh, we can look at all the points that uh, are singular in H uh, and impose that there's no uh, curvature blow-ups over there. In Lorentzian signature, this results in uh, this condition between the intersection product of the charges and the uh, harmonic, harmonic functions that are captured by uh, this vector big H. 
that's written over here. And uh, this is, these are precisely the uh, solutions that uh, the Neff and Moore studied that were important for understanding the uh, moduli spaces of, uh, of supergravity. Uh, however, in Euclidean signature, uh, we can do the same thing as before and split uh, different poles into centers and anti-centers. And now, just as before, where I had this combination of U and A being equal to beta over 4 pi, it turns out uh, that uh, these intersection inner products are related to the factor of beta over 4 pi. Um, so uh, the solution now changes. If I want to study, for instance, uh, a single, uh, a Lorentzian solution that has a single center, this is the analog of Reinz, the extremal Reinz to Nordstrom black hole, I instead have to study the analog of the Kernumann black hole, which has a center and an anti-center. Uh, so now there is uh, two poles in uh, all these harmonic functions. And uh, it turns out that the smoothness condition that I wrote on the previous slide, these, uh, completely fix the distance between the center and anti-center. But it fixes to, it to be something beta dependent and dependent on the scalar moduli uh, that you fix at infinity. So in fact, you can plot what the value of the scale, you can solve for the scalar on the entire solution and plot what the scalar is uh, on the horizon. As you go uh, from the North Pole, you can think about this as the North Pole to the South Pole of the horizon. And you explicitly see that it depends on the moduli that you fix in, at infinity. It depends on the asymptotic values of the scalars. Except at one point where it takes precisely the same value as that in, of the attractor solution in, in Lorentzian signature. And from this, you can actually compute the area and angular momentum. And you find that both have a very complicated dependence on the inverse temperature and on the scalar moduli. However, what's beautiful, once again, is that the same thing that happened in Israel Wilson, where the over, overall the free energy was extremely simple, uh, is, uh, is reproduced in this case, where one finds that uh, the overall Gibbs free energy is, uh, is completely independent of C and beta. And the fact that it's independent can actually be uh, tracked down to the fact that we've imposed these smoothness constraints in Euclidean signature. Uh, and we can proceed similar for multicenter cases. So the take home message is that we found gravitational solutions that contribute to the index and found a subtle analog of the attractor mechanism for both the temperature and the scalar moduli in the theory, where it's no longer true that uh, since we don't have infinite throats, it's no longer true that the areas of the black hole are independent of the boundary conditions. But what's true is that their overall contribution to the partition function is, which is the only thing that, uh, that we needed in order to be consistent with the expectation from an index. Uh, I'll just leave this slide. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Victor. Uh, questions? Sorry, it's just a clarification because mm -hmm. in the first part of your talk, there was like a small deformation, right? You just gave a small temperature to regulate this zero mode. Yes, yes. And then you came back to... Yes, yeah, so but here it's a finite. Yeah, so this applies at absolutely any temperature. The point of doing the uh, calculation, the, the point, the beginning was to motivate the fact that we can't actually study the extremal solutions just at zero temperature. They might receive large quantum corrections, so we don't exactly know uh, how they contribute to various observables. Then, uh, instead, we can study them at finite temperature. These solutions, uh, don't necessarily even have an ADS2 throat. They're just genuine supergravity solutions where all uh, proper lengths are finite between any two points on, uh, on the geometry, unlike the extremal throats. Um, yeah, so uh, the point is that uh, in these cases, uh, we can actually be much more confident that uh, the saddle point uh, that the uh, Euclidean gravitational path integral sees is under control. 
as opposed to the extremal case where we showed that the fluctuations become very large because of the presence of this probe. But what about what, they are, what are the actual Lorentzian physical solutions that this index is counting? Yeah, so, so the surprising thing is that, uh, well, so this is a Euclidean calculation. You just follow uh, what the trace tells you to compute. Um, the surprising thing is that uh, the, these Euclidean solutions count the number of states of solutions that have completely different geometry. Right? Like uh, these solutions have uh, finite throats, but naively we think that we, they actually count the number of extremal microstates that you have. It's just a trick uh, that in some sense is guaranteed to work by supersymmetry that tells you uh, that uh, the Euclidean path integral reproduces the number of microstates uh, that, are, that correspond to extremal black holes, to the BPS black holes. Thank you. There's one thing if you could comment on this Israel Wilson solutions of Kerr, you say Kerr Newman can be thought of as an Israel Wilson solution with two a source and an anti source. Yes, yes. So this sounds awfully similar to the wild class of solutions. Is there a connection? Uh, which solutions? The, the wild class of solutions where you have solutions with two killing isometries, let's say in four dimensions, uh -huh. where you can write down this Newtonian rod structure uh, with finite Newtonian rods that basically. I haven't thought about that. But uh, well, we can talk afterwards. Yeah. I have a separate question. So, does this also account for uh, entropy of solutions which are super entropic? These Enigma solutions of Deneff and Moore. Yes, I believe so. So, it's, so it, seems also that, it seems that we see these solutions in Euclidean signature as well. Uh, it's just that they're more complicated. The solution, th those solutions that you're referring to have two centers in Lorentzian signature. Yes. And then you could think about those two centers splitting each into a center and anti-center. And one co confusing point is that the moduli space of uh, centers, anti-center pairs is different than the moduli space that Ben F. and Moore found. So for instance, in the case of the black holes that uh, lead to the entropy enigma, the distance between the centers is fixed mm -hmm. uh, by, the smooth, by the smoothness condition in Lorentzian signature. Yes. Uh, by this condition, you could explicitly write out. Here, you now have four points mm -hmm. and uh, a total of uh, four constraints. Yes. Uh, one constraint is satisfied trivially. It turns out that one constraint is just the sum of all the uh, sources and anti-sources is zero. Uh, so you're left with three constraints. But there is a, you know, uh, you have four points in a three-dimensional space with three constraints. That's not enough to fix all the points. So even in the case that uh, they studied, there's an entire much uh, richer moduli space of Euclidean solutions. And it will be good to understand, uh, number one, how to quantize that moduli space in order to actually contrib com compute the contributions of these solutions to the partition function or to the index. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, number two, uh, which uh, ones of the two, which one of the two prescriptions is correct? Is it the one that they found in uh, Lorentzian signature that has the problem that it has infinitely long throats, mm -hmm. or is it this in Euclidean signature where the geometries are smooth? Thank you. Maybe use the uh, mic. I just want to say, just to add to that, they could both be correct in principle. But also, this doesn't solve the enigma. I think it's important to say that. But the enigma is the fact that you don't see those solutions in the microscopic index. So this is giving you a third integral to do, which is supposed to be equal to um, do, do you see any wall crossing phenomena in, in the moduli? Or, um... Um, yeah, it's a bit unclear. These equations are much harder to solve than the equations that they had. Um, so we haven't had enough time to fully look for a wall crossing. Yeah, uh, well, wall crossing would correspond to uh, places where you change the, for people 
that don't know. Um, it's uh, these solutions depend on the asymptotic val these constraints depend on the asymptotic values of the scalars. And sometimes when you change the asymptotic values of the scalars, you could lose your solutions. Uh, and that corresponds on the field theory side to a wall crossing phenomenon. And I don't know yet if, uh, if uh, uh, that's the case here. Is it, yeah, since, since you have, have a richer moduli space, it, it'd be interesting to compare the... Um, yes, yes, yes. But also I don't know what phenomenon. to compare to in some sense. You can compare it to their gravitational calculation, um, which you know uh, one might think is not trustworthy, as I previously mentioned. Uh, I don't know if there's a field theory calculation that you could compare it to. Go ahead. Yeah, quick comment. I mean, one test would be to set the scalars at infinity to the attractive values of the black hole. Then in the Lorentzian theory, you know that, so you set the scalars to the attractive values of the black hole. So then there you know that, at least in the Lorentzian theory, there's no other solution. So you go to the attractive region and, and make sure that there's no fault crossing. So that would be a test of, of what you were asking. Right. So, so how, how, do, how do these solutions account for it, somehow they should not contribute? Okay, uh, sure. So should I think of beta as just a free parameter here yes. and you get the same answer no matter what? Yes, beta yes, is? yes. So we check that at the level of the action. This is what I have of the Euclidean on shell action. Uh, for single center black holes, we also checked it at the level of one loop determinants and higher loop determinants in this localization computation. Uh, I don't know for multi center black holes how to show that these volumes of the moduli spaces are independent of beta and also that all the other one loop determinants are independent of beta. That's some, uh, some homework to do. So if I take the limit beta goes to infinity, then I see many and you know, many copies of the Schwarzschild type thing, one for each throat? Presumably, yes, yes, that would be the idea. Yeah. Okay. But somehow uh, the calculation of the, that comes from the Schwarzschild should also be reproduced by doing the calculation completely, uh, you know, by doing the calculation even in the limit when uh, beta goes to zero. Right, so as, be uh, as beta goes, um, you know, uh, from infinity to a smaller value, the the Schwartz, the, if you track that Schwarzschild, it gets less and less strongly coupled. Yes. So is this a way of understand, is this another way of understanding why the Schwarzschild thing was one loop exact? It didn't depend on the coupling constant. Perhaps, although, um, yeah, the, uh, the fact that, in this case, it's true that the Schwarzschild is one loop exact um, around each saddle. But uh, there is, yeah, let me, let me just make a quick comment. In order to see the delta function that I showed you in the density of states, this delta function, one actually has to do a one loop expansion around an infinite number of saddles and then resum an infinite number of saddles. Maybe uh, on, on the other hand, if you just compute the index, you just need to do the expansion on one saddle, in which case the one loop determinant is a constant, it's completely independent of beta and also reproduces this delta function. So yeah, perhaps uh, that it is a way in a way that would show that the sports in is one loop, super sports in is one loop exact. Okay, one last question. Uh, it, in the second part of your talk, was the role of the fact that you're doing supergravity just to eliminate these uh, these cases with higher n that you higher n uh, higher number of centers? You mean uh, higher little n when this Kerr, like in the Kerr-Newman case where you have the uh, yeah oh. Uh, yes, 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 yes. That's the, that's the role in this case. If you didn't have supergravity, um, yeah, then, uh, uh, 
all these saddles would contribute, and you wouldn't get that the answer takes the structure of an index. It's funny because even in the regular theory of gravity, the leading saddle looks like an index. It's only the subleading saddles that have beta dependence. So if we look here, uh, this is the answer from the leading saddle. It doesn't matter whether it's gravity or supergravity. And the higher order saddles have higher values of beta omega so that they're non-protributively suppressed, uh, but they don't take the form of an index. So even in a non-supersymmetric theory, there is, uh, it's, uh, it's the leading answer takes the form of an index. Th does that answer your question? Okay. Okay. So I think we'll end there. Uh, there is a reception and dinner, and let's thank Victor again for a nice talk.